We are the Cat's Whiskers, and this is my top line. Hello and welcome to My Top Line, I'm Jonathan Bullard. Second edition of this new podcast from the Cat's Whiskers and I'm delighted to say that our guest for this episode is none other than Mr Andy Awood. Andy, how are you? Not too bad, thank you very much. How are you about yourself? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for coming on. Um, a, a great lineup that you, you've chosen. Has a little bit of a theme going through it, I think, that people will find out. But I think it's fair to say you, you are more of a fan of the rougher side of the game. I think that's fair to say, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's it's it is what first attracted me to the sport, as as you'll find out later. And it's something that throughout throughout my time coming, it's it's sort of the aspect of the game that, that I like. It's it's an aspect of a game that I appreciate is dwindling a bit. But every now and then you get you get that glimpse of hope where you sign a player that takes you back a little bit to the to the to the olden days as it were and uh it's it's exciting it's it, you know there's a stadium full of people and and whenever two people drop the gloves so there's a big hit there's there's a, an atmosphere that erupts that you don't see for the the other sort of 59 minutes other than other than goals going in so it's it always gets talked about as being part of a game that should be should be going but whenever it happens you see so many thousand people completely engrossed and uh and on their feet, clapping and cheering. So, yeah, I love it. Before we get on to your team, just find out a little bit more about your hockey watching history. So, big fan of the Nottingham Panthers, as I think most people will know from your appearances on the Cats Whiskers podcast. But also, when was your first game? My first game was the the third of October two thousand and one, and it was uh, Panthers versus Sheffield, and we lost two one. Yes, um, and I, I, if I remember rightly, was that the game where Scott Allison and Barry Nykoff faced each other for the first time after the Blench clearance? It is indeed, and obviously, as a as a twelve year old boy, I was completely unaware of anything that had happened before. So, so basically, my parents were decorating their bedroom. I was at school. I came home from school, and uh, they'd been they'd have the radio on. And uh, they mentioned about the fact that Panthers were playing Sheffield, and my parents just said, "Did I, did I want to go?" And I said, "Yes, why not? You know, nothing, nothing else sort of, sort of to do." Uh, so we went, and and it was it was just a complete buzz. It was uh, it was something I'd never seen before in terms of the general sort of experience of, of ice hockey. You know, I'd, I'd been to football games before, various stadiums around, around the country, but it was it was coming to the hockey that really sort of opened my eyes a little bit in terms of as how how great it was. And obviously, as you mentioned, it's the first time that, that Nike and Allison had seen each other since the, the bench clearance. But obviously, when I stepped into that arena for the first time, I had no no idea about any of that. I had no idea about the, you know, the actual sport itself, what to expect, um, and was just completely blown away by it. And uh, like I say, so that's, what, 19 seasons now, I think, where I've been coming back. And I certainly think from... Uh, from that first game I went to in, in, in 2001, certainly for probably the next seven or eight seasons, at the very least, uh, I didn't miss a home match. Uh, and then obviously there were spells where I probably did most of the away games as well. But it was uh, it was definitely something that, that sort of hooked me straight away. OK, we're going to move straight on to your team, starting with the netminder. So, Andy, who is your choice of netminder? It's Rastislav Rovnianek. Rastislav Rovnianek, who played 54 games for the Panthers over the 2006-7 and the 2007-8 season. Uh, a great season in 6-7. He came in halfway through the season, 27 games for a goals against average of 2.37 and a 92.1% save percentage in league games. Then in the playoffs, four games, a 1.65 goals against average and a 95.1% save average in those four playoff games. Of course, 2007-8 wasn't as good for him, and he ended up getting replaced by Tomaski. But Andy, why, why particularly have you chosen Rodney Anek? Well, I, I don't know if it's if it's to do with my age at the time, or just generally. It'd be interesting to, to hear your opinion on this, but... 
he was the first goalie I saw from from when I started going. Obviously, in the, in the second year of, of, of the arena, I'd never seen Trevor Robbins. He was the first goalie that made me realise how crucial a role the goalie was. So for the you know for the first sort of five five years or so five or six years that I'd been going, it was all about scoring goals. It was all about you know having tough guys and and really skillful players and stuff like that. And I never really thought much about the defence or, or defencemen and, and obviously subsequently netminders. And obviously that season we we started off with Evan Lindsay, I believe, and it it didn't go well. And we replaced him with this guy who came in. He was quite old. He couldn't speak any English. Uh, he wore number four, which completely blew my mind because I was like, "This guy's is this guy a joke?" What's you know? I, I I know I hadn't been around the game for for too long at this point, but I I, I sort of I've been around long enough to realise that that goalies don't tend to wear number four. And he sort of completely revolutionised netminding for me in terms of, of in terms of how I viewed it. I, remember, I can't remember the game, but there was a there was a there was a play where a player dumped the puck towards the net towards his net and it was coming straight towards him and there was a there was a forward chasing after it and it was really quite close as to who was going to get there first in terms of was the player going to get there was was Rasta going to go out and try and challenge him was he going to stay in his net and just and just let him get the puck and fancy his chances on the, on the breakaway but he sort of skated out a little bit and just angled his stick ever so slightly and and the puck just deflected off his stick and he just casually put his hand out and caught it in his catching glove and I'd never seen something so ridiculous in my life. Like the calmness and the experience of him was just something to behold. And 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 ultimately, you know, that that seven eight season, I think he was probably found out a little bit in the sense of I think people realised what to expect from him. But going into that season when he came in halfway through, for, for me, net minded, they'd always been they'd always been goalies that sort of stayed around the crease and they just waited for the shot to come in. Whereas Rasta was the first goalie I sort of noticed that was that was coming out and challenging players. He was poke checking players on breakaways. He was skating out and, and skating towards players uh, and putting the pressure and the onus on them. And uh, it just sort of changed the way I, I sort of viewed things. And obviously with on the back of that, the, the whole playoff experience that we went through that season, it was quite phenomenal you know we we won the quarterfinals for semifinals and the final on penalty shots and and ultimately he was a massive massive reason of that and as much as sometimes you sit there thinking it's a bit tedious and a bit tiring it's it's 2020 and we still do that thing after the game that would be that he bought in uh, yeah, he's, he's had he's had uh whether you like it or not he's had a, a a lasting legacy on this club i don't doubt that he's not the best netminder i've ever seen you know, Craig Kowalski fits that bill in terms of the net miners that I've seen. But I think the thing with Rasta was he was so different to what I'd been used to, and he was the first net miner that I'd I'd seen that made me interested in watching net miners. You know, he he would make miraculous saves. He would do ridiculous things. We went to we went to Belfast. Uh, I think we lost the game seven three or seven four, and we were awful throughout the game. And there was one point where. I think they scored a goal that he uh, he either thought was a man in the crease or it was with a high stick, and he went he went crazy at Nigel Boniface. And obviously, I'm guessing completely in Slovakian, so no one could really do anything about it. But he probably called him every name under the sun. And then in the next sort of play, the net was the net was off, but it was only off by like three or four inches, if that. It, you know, it was it was it had been knocked but not been fully removed. And he kept trying to get Boniface's attention as the play broke down to, to the Belfast end of the ice. So obviously, Rasta was trying to get the attention of the referees to sort of say, look, the net's off, I've stopped the play or come and sort it out because he wasn't going to do it. Uh, and, and nothing happened. So when Belfast then broke back into the, into the zone, he just he literally, he was he was waving his arms around, trying to get attention. Uh, and as soon as he realised he wasn't going to get it, he just turned around and pushed the net right across to the, to the boards and just stood there and just went, the net's the net's not on, and I, I, again, I just never seen anything quite so audacious uh, from a netminder. It was just bizarre, but at the same time, he was good. You know, he he had got that experience, uh, and he'd played at, at pretty high levels throughout his career. But obviously, we we caught him at his uh, probably past his prime, but he was still pretty damn good for what we were for for, for what I was used to uh, watching my hockey. 
Yeah, I, I think you, you're right when you say he was someone who you probably not seen like that before, who played in that style. I always remember when Paul Barham used to say that he, he always caught down rather than catching up uh, and put the puck on the ice. It, it was a very, very different style that he had and he he had that unique uh, goalie helmet that was blue with with just a like a junior face yeah. cage on it it, it yeah. wasn't like a normal netminder helmet but he was a massive part of us winning that playoff title in 2007 absolutely i think i think realistically other than trevor Gallant, he was probably the most important player in that in that whole playoff run when we brought Gallant in the back end of that season it was a statement of intent that we were making a push to win the playoffs. But I think, as much as everyone up their game ups their game in the playoffs, uh, and certainly we saw players up their game quite measurably in, the, in that playoff series. I, I think Rasta was just different class. And ultimately, like I say, when it goes down to penalty shootout and and you win three on the bounce like that, you you, you can only really look at your netminder and say thank you very much, well done. Yeah, nine penalty shots he faced, he saved every single one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, we're going to leave Rasto there and move on to your first defenceman. So, Andy, defenceman number one, please. From the same season, I've I've picked Mike Rees. Mike Rees, 51 games for the Panthers in the 2006-07 season, had previously captained the Bracknell Bees as well. He scored four goals and 12 assists and 191 penalty minutes. So, why Mike Rees? Because he was scary. We sort of affectionately called him Scary Mike Rees because he was he was quite a nasty person. I remember in in Hull, we went to we went to a game in Hull and we were we were queuing up to to go in when the when the team bus pulled him and players got off the bus and that and they're walking past us and things like that and um some of the people we were with were, were talking to Mike Rees and um he actually said to to one of them which player should I go for today so I I sort of looked in it in in shock and sort of like oh wow they said a name and sure enough in that game he, he went straight for him and it was dirty in a sense of it was things like cross checks and, and constantly just being there and just being in his face and as soon as the whistle would go he'd give him a quick jab or he'd give him a quick push or the glove would go in the face along the boards you know the stick would be in his back and things like that and I think he went through a spell that season as well of, of, of getting into fights with Hall players and having them dislocate shoulders I'm sure he had two that season where Hall players ended up injured on the back of fighting Mike Reese. Yeah, I seem to recall that he did injure a couple of players, but I'm sure if there's any former Stingrays fans listening, they, they can tweet in and uh, tell us who it was, because I, I don't recall yeah. off the top of my head at the minute. I have a, well, I have a feeling Jake Riddle might have been one, and I, I, can't, I can't think who the other one was, but I, I, for some reason I've got it in my head that he had, he had two fights, both in Hull, and both players ended up being injured from the fights. And my, and my first recollection of Mike Rees was we went to Romford for a pre-season game. And I don't know if anyone's been to Romford, but where the, where the players' benches, there's stairs. They go up and then and then they, they get to like a, a peak and then they go down to the bench. A set of stairs up from the dressing room to the to the top. I've had like two or three stairs down to the, to the players' bench, I'm guessing, if my memory is right. And the players have started coming onto the ice. You've got people like Patrico and, and Rod Stevens and uh, Evan Lindsay at the time and stuff like that. And then Mike Rees sort of runs out and he falls down the stairs. <laughs> and I immediately remember thinking, what the hell have we signed here? <laughs> <laughs> and he, he, he's been one of my favourite favorite players ever since. And, you know, he just... That, that playoff series against Sheffield, that, that home leg against Sheffield in the playoffs, he was absolutely incredible. Just, if anyone got within 10 feet of, of Rob Yannick, they were, they were going to know about it. And he just he just pushed people away. He was just getting in people's faces. There's that famous part of, of that game where uh, Regan Darby jumps into Dave Page's uh, photograph booth and, and punches Ryan Schmier. The reaction from Page is hilarious as he's, as he's cradling his camera, trying to make sure he keeps that safe. And Woolhouse is sort of like quite shocked. And Schmier is sort of there in a sort of, shall I go for it or shall I not? And then all out of nowhere, because he's down the far end of, of the bench, you just see Mike Rees absolutely run past Schmier trying to get at him. 
and it it personified him. He was he was up for it every game, and he wasn't going to back down from from anyone. And he wasn't the biggest guy by any stretch, but he was he played the game incredibly physically. And, and as a defenseman, it, it was it's one of the things I like in in my I like them to be to be physical. I, I want to see defensemen that that clear out the, the crease. Um, and get stuck in, and, and Mike Reese did did all of that. We'll leave Mike Reese there. Clearly, you have a lot of fun memories of him, as I think most of us do from that great playoff winning season. But we're going to move on to your favourite game now. So, Andy, what is your favourite Panthers game of all time? Uh, my favourite Panthers game of all time is is what I believe is the is the greatest playoff final of all time, which is the the 2011 playoff final against Cardiff. Panthers winning by five goals to four. Of course, they were two goals down twice in that game before David Alessandro Beauregard came up with the winner in the third period. And of course, in the semi-final against the Sheffield Steelers, Panthers were two goals down but pulled that back, winning in overtime thanks to Robert Lakovic. So why particularly that game? What was it about that game that made it so special for you? Uh, well, well, I think as a as a Panthers fan, uh, winning the playoffs was an incredible feeling. But I think that the whole roller coaster of emotions that we went through in that playoff final was like something else that we'd, we, that we'd not seen before. Obviously, we'd been intense. Well, I say I say we'd never seen it before. I'd never seen it before. I'd been intense finals. Obviously, we we talked about when we talked about Rasper in the playoffs. Obviously, that was a draw going into a shootout. That was pretty nail biting. I think that season as well, Cardiff had gone on that ridiculous winning streak. They'd got Craig Weller and brought him in, and, and he'd made a massive difference. Uh, and they were, I believe, they were they were incredibly close to, to winning the league that year. I think um, Sheffield won it by a point, or it was level on points, in the, and it was a tight yeah. break situation. It, it was incredibly incredibly close. And obviously, for a spell, they were they were not even close to being in it. But that that whole that whole run that they went on. It made world news, I believe. It was a world was a, record like, at the time. Like 22 games 22 or something games, like that. Yeah. And they were really good. They'd got some incredibly good players. And we went 2-0 down. And then we scored a redirected goal by Beauregard to bring it back. And then they scored again. And and the, and the third goal to make it 3-1 was, was 32 seconds into the second period. So we went into the second period 2-1 down. And then we start. Infinity scores within the, the first thirty seconds or so, and you, you automatically think, "Ah, oh, it's just going to be one of them days." We just can't seem to, you know, stop conceding goals, and and this team are too good. But we bowed back, and we and we bowed back through two ridiculous goals. So Gerard Adams gives a puck away to Galbraith behind the net, just completely unforced error, and and really bizarre. He just turns it over and passes it to Galbraith, who then finds Myers in front, and, and he manages to score. And then, well, just to, just quickly, just quickly before before you move on to the next one, I think that goal was probably less than a minute after Cardiff had gone three one ahead, right at the start of the second period, if my memory serves me correctly. Right. Okay. So, so clearly, that was a massively important time to get back within one goal so soon Huge. after Cardiff had, had gone ahead. By two goals, definitely. Because I think as well, particularly if you if you go if you go two goals down and then you go two goals down twice, you you have to make sure you get the next one because it it it, it starts to become, you know, no matter how good the team is, it starts to become insurmountable, and and just the feeling of if you if you don't score, uh, and the other team has has got that cushion, it, it just make it just heaps the pressure on you so much that it, it becomes vital. But I mean, of all the players to give the puck away to behind the net. Galbraith would be be the first choice on most people in 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 most teams list to be able to set you know set up a pass from behind the net. So so we were quite lucky with that one. And then if we were lucky with that one, the the, the equalising goal was just a, a farce almost. So Nielsen chips the puck from from our own zone, and it's bouncing, and Harima just gets a stick on it, and it, it somehow sort of bundles past Stevie Lyle and sort of like rolls up a, a Cardiff player's stick and, and, and goes over his pad and under his catcher uh, and somehow we've managed to, to pull it back but then we get that dagger where, where Brad Voss scores and we go into the, the third period trading again so you know we've had this we've already had this emotional roller coaster already by being down and then we finally managed to pull it back and then 
they go down the other end of the score again. And and like I say, you just you just get that feeling that it's just going to be one of them days where no matter how close you manage to keep it, they're just going to keep going down the other end of the scoring. And then third period, Billy Ryan goes coast to coast and Great scores. Goal. Absolutely fantastic goal. And I wasn't overly struck on Billy Ryan that season, but that is a goal that you know is etched into my memory. It's it's it was superb. And then the winning goal was just it was just fantastic you know it was we've got Kachuk, Harima and, and Beauregard on a line and they really clicked and uh, we managed to win the face off get a cut get a shot off I think it was saved and then we worked the puck around a bit and then from a tight angle Beauregard just manages to find the, the tiniest of gaps through Stevie Lyle's legs yeah because it, it, Lyle had lost his stick hadn't he yeah and I and think I, that I, just left that gap where normally his stick would have been. Absolutely. And I think, ultimately, there's nobody else on the ice. Maybe John Pell, uh, Pelle, who was, at, who was at Cardiff that year, who probably could have scored that goal. It's It was just... It was it personified Beauregard. It, it, of just pure goal-scoring genius. He knew where the net was. He knew where the gaps were. And if you got him a puck and he had that opportunity, he was going to score because the angle was against him. You know, I think there might have been another player sort of not necessarily in between him and, and and Stevie Lyle, but sort of in the way. And he just had that ability to find the net. And I think looking at all the finals that I've seen since I've been coming, I just think that obviously from a Cardiff fan's perspective, that must have been a devastating game to watch. I appreciate that. But it was a, a very good game to watch. As a Panthers fan, it obviously it was it was pure elation. But I think as a neutral as well, or maybe not Sheffield neutral, um, <laughs> but as a as a neutral, it was such a good game to watch because it was it was just it ebbed and flowed. It was physical and it was a really good game. And I think, like I say, in my opinion, it's the best player final that I've ever seen. And I think with it being the showcase, you know, like the the final piece of of the, of the Elite League season, the fact we won it. And the fact that the game was so good, that's why it's my favourite game. Great stuff. I, I don't think I can really add anything to, to what you've just said there because it was, it, like you say, it was an absolutely fantastic game of hockey with, I think, every emotion you went through. And I, I, well, think, we, it, I think it's a great choice. We did sort of try and keep it interesting towards the end as well because I think, I think Craig Weller took a penalty in like the last two and a half minutes. So we were on the power play going into the end of it, and, and then inexplicably, and then, uh, we, we just let them. Well, we let them have the puck with like 15 seconds left, just as well. I came out the box, and obviously they clear the zone. And for some reason, rather than staying in his net, Kowalski skates out to beat the puck, and and I think Finity's chasing it down, and Weller's there, and there's collision. Watching it back now, because you know what happens and you see where the puck goes, it's fine. But I remember at the time thinking, my God, the puck's loose and the net's completely empty. And if, if the refs haven't called that as a, as a, as a penalty on, for hitting Kowalski, they've got an empty net to shoot at. And there's still 10 seconds on the clock. And you sort of think, we had this in the bag two minutes ago. We're just keeping it exciting, I believe, is, uh, is, is what I like to think of it as. <laughs> Yeah, which was a, was a trademark, I suppose, of your next choice and your second defenceman, who, of course, the architect of a lot of success for the Nottingham Panthers. So, Andy, who is defenceman number two for you? Corey Nielsen. Corey Nielsen, of course, four hundred and three games, eighty five goals, and three hundred and assists for the Nottingham Panthers. Won fourteen trophies overall as a player and a coach. Uh, 12 of those as a coach but the full list is one elite league title one continental cup five playoffs and seven challenge cups so Andy Corey Nielsen over to you I'm going to say something quite outlandish here in that I think he's the best defenseman I've ever seen play for Panthers now I appreciate that I've seen Jimmy Pack but when I saw Jimmy Pack play I was 12 and 13 so I didn't appreciate quite how good he was and then, obviously, since then we'd had other defensemen, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sure that it will be a, a debate that will go on till the end of time. But in, in my time span, he was just different class. He came in with the height and the CV, and I remember Mike Ellis saying that he was too good for this league. And that first season, I think he he struggled. But then I mentioned about players in that playoff series, uh, sort of up in their game. 
and he really did. It was a, a, such an odd transformation because he went from being sort of, you could tell he'd got talent and you could tell he was good, but for some reason it just didn't click throughout most of the season. And then that playoff series, he was just absolutely incredible. And well, I remember he went when... zero to hero, really, didn't he? In, absolutely, in a very short yeah. space so, of time. So he, he scored the penalty shot against uh, against Sheffield. He scored the winning penalty shot against Sheffield in that, in that uh, quarterfinal for the playoffs. And I remember when they announced his name, I sort of thought, oh, wow, Nielsen. I mean, we've got a team full of goal scorers and we've gone for a defenseman. And, and he scored. And I, I think, did he score against... Who did we play in the semis? Was it Belfast? Yeah, he scored I against th- Belfast. You think it, he it scored was against the same Belfast, t- it was, then... It was Nielsen and McCancel and Nielsen and McCancel and then Gallant missed both and then Gallant scored in the in the final. Yeah, because uh, I, I remember saying... Uh, I, remember, I remember hearing, sorry, that Corey had played with Phil O'Sair at, I, I think, Pensacola, maybe. And... He said, whilst he'd got in his mind, he knew what he wanted to do and, and, and was trying to do it. He said afterwards, he, he said he kind of felt like Osair probably knew his tells and, and knew what he would try and do. Um, and obviously he, he saved it. But I just think generally his his overall game from that playoff series to when he to when he hung up the skates uh, and retired in, in 2012-13 season, he was just a completely different class. And yes, you know, certainly towards the end, the, the, the legs went and he got slower and he took a lot of like hooking penalties and things like that. But he was still racking up points. He got 300 assists for Panthers and 85 goals over his 403 games across all competitions. And it was numbers like I'd not seen before from defensemen. Well, for um, a defenseman to score almost a point a game. Yeah. Even when you go back to then and you you can probably legitimately say the standard of the elite league wasn't as good as what it is now but even so for a defenseman to be scoring nearly a point a game is nothing short of phenomenal no absolutely you know and he he was he was fun to watch you know he was he was great because whenever but you know particularly on the power play and, and things like that where you'd get him on that point and, and you, you could see things working. And I think it particularly clicked, obviously, the year we won the league, because I think we went about 25% on the power play. But there was that spell where they do the crossover, of, you know, Clark and Nielsen on the point, and you genuinely didn't know which one of them was going to shoot. It was great to have such options at the point that it, it made it so much more difficult for for the defending team, you know. And don't get me wrong, obviously, I think certainly towards, towards the end of you know, his playing career, people caught wind of what was happening a little bit and things like that for me he was he was phenomenal and and really really good and and you know in terms of obviously this is obviously my top line so in terms of playing I think he's the best defense when I saw certainly from an age where I, I sort of feel like I understood hockey a bit better but also you know for the coaching side of, uh, again I know it's early days still technically because it's only been two seasons since he's gone a, a bad season was winning the Continental Cup that was uh, that's arguably the, one of the worst seasons I've seen, and we came away with a trophy in Europe. You know, it's it, he, he's he's raised the bar massively for for hockey in Nottingham in terms of trophy output. You know, from from the years I first started coming, we didn't win anything for a few years. Then we won the then we won the Challenge Cup in Sheffield with our Roos scoring that goal. And then there was nothing for a couple of years before we won the playoffs. And then obviously when when Corey took over, it. it it became almost regular. It was it was a feature. It was 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 silverware. You know, I just think he was he was integral to that. Particularly, obviously, like I say, as as a coach, but I think certainly in those early years as well, when we're winning the, the sort of the, the cup doubles and then you know the the five Challenge Cups in a row and the three playoffs in a row, he was integral to that on the ice. Probably one of the best defensemen in the elite league era, certainly in terms of point scoring as well. Do you- do you feel that's fair, or do you think there's anyone around the the league you could say was better? If you're building uh, an, like an elite league, an all elite league roster of of players that have spent, you know, not necessarily huge amount of time here, but certainly more than just like your one seasons of them they disappear, uh, he's 100 percent he's on that list. But you've got you've got to think, you know, players like Jonathan Weaver potentially in, in Coventry. Um, I think Corey even said if you're going to retire retire and sign Jonathan Weaver because he's the only player in the league that was better than him at doing what he did 
you know, and then obviously there's what you want from a defenseman as well. So, you know, like he's a completely different defenseman to someone like Mike Reeves, for instance, you know, so you think about people like that Sheffield have had particularly in the past, like, uh, like Steve Munn or uh, Bollybrook on his, certainly Bollybrook on his first in potentially there's an argument there that they probably make the, the top defensive line potentially. But uh, for me, he would be in it a hundred percent. And I don't think it's a surprise that he was one of the people that was picked for the, for the Boston Bruins game. He, he fits that bill. He's elite league royalty, whether people like it or not. Okay. As we're talking about players from other teams, we're going to ask you who is your player from another team who you would have loved to have seen play in Nottingham. So, Andy, what are you? You've got a couple of choices, but there's some yeah. good stories around these. Yeah, I'm, I'm cheating a little bit because Dennis Maxwell springs to mind because he was my. He's probably still is my all-time favourite non-Panthers player. Okay, let's go with um, Maxwell first then, before we reveal your second. Yeah. One. So, so the thing with Maxwell was was I I I loved the way he played. I loved the way he coached, particularly when he was at London Racers. <laughs> um, and he was he was he was great fun. He was he was entertainment. He was he he'd score goals. I think he was just under a point a game in the Elite League. He'd been around the ISL. Obviously, he scored that that goal that knocked us out of a playoff semi final with like was it point two seconds to go or point four seconds to go something like that when he was at London Knights. He was physical. He was no nonsense. He'd fight. Obviously, he had that fantastic scrap with Christine Gosselin where he he then climbed over the well broke the glass between the penalty boxes and climbed into into the Bracknell Bees penalty box to fight Christine Gosselin. And I I loved it. I thought it was great. You know, I I went to. I went to Coventry a few times to go see London play when he was at London. I mean, I'd, admittedly, there was there was more of a draw than Dennis Maxwell that year because it was Wade Belak and Eric Cairns, um, mm. particularly were were big draws to go and watch. But the reason why I kind of feel like he's cheating is because he he did play for us. He he played he, he played one game uh, against Cologne Sharks yes, and he, scored. Yes, uh, in it's after seventy one seconds, I think it was. Very, and, very and early wore, on in the game. And he wore 71. He, he wore 71. Yeah, so we, we played Cologne Sharks, and I think we had um, Martin Massa, Rod Sarich, Mark Dutiem, and, and Dennis Maxwell played in that game. And it was actually Maxwell's last game in, in the UK that, yes, he, he, that he played. Think it, and obviously, I think he was sacked the day after. And obviously, he scored a goal. And then at the end of the year, when Panthers did their shirt auctions... I managed to get Dennis Maxwell's only game one Panther shirt for thirty pounds, and it's 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 my most prized shirt out of all the ones I own. One because it was so cheap, and two because it was it was it was Maxwell. But the reason why I chose him is because I was actually on holiday when we played Clone Sharks, so I still have never seen Dennis Maxwell play for Panthers. <laughs> um, so that's why he's he's in. But technically, he did play for Panthers. So. So I also throw in uh, a second one, which would be Matthew Waugh from, from Sheffield. Matthew Waugh, 302 games for 162 goals and 162 assists. That is, of course, his combined total at the Sheffield Steelers, where he had four seasons and one at the Glasgow clan at this season just gone. He won two Elite League titles and a playoff title. They were all at the Steelers. So what was so special about Matthew Waugh for you? He just seemed to win every game and and was clutch in doing so. He would he would score big goals, he would win crucial face offs, um he would play with a physical edge for someone that was so small. Um just annoying. I used to hate him because he was so good. He was so good around the net. For someone that's so small and you think of some of the defensemen that he would have come up against in terms of their size, and you just sort of think, you just just move him out of the way. But his body positioning, his strength, his core strength, and his, his balance, he was always the first person to a loose puck if, if the puck was around the crease, and always seemed to score. And I hated that. But I would have loved to have seen that for us. And I and I do think as well that we went through a spell where we didn't really have a player like that that you could sort of you could chuck on the ice and you were almost guaranteed to to get the face off or you were losing a game by a goal and that last five minutes you knew that they would create 
at least two or three good chances and, and the possibility and probability of them scoring. And for for a time, when whenever we, we played for him, he just seemed to always be on the score sheet. He was a winner. He does fit that, that sort of Sheffield mentality of, of players in that, you know, he, he goes all out and above and beyond to, to get the win, whether it's sort of legal or slightly illegal uh, in terms of in terms of play. But he was he's damn good. And ultimately that's that's why I'd like to have seen him. Although I must admit my favourite story about Matthew War is when he returned to Sheffield with the Glasgow clan earlier this season, won the game and uh, went off wearing a Burger King crown <laughs> to, to say he wasn't the King of Sheffield anymore. <laughs> And, and seemingly has a sense of humour. So there you go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> OK, let's uh, go on to your forward lines now. Uh, and I think the first one you've chosen may raise a few eyebrows. So who is the first forward in your forward lines? Uh, my first forward in my forward lines is Barry Nyker. Barry Nykar, uh, we've got his uh, Ice Hockey Super League and playoff stats, 132 games, 15 goals, 29 assists. 671 penalty minutes in three seasons playing for the Panthers. As I said, it's probably an unusual choice, bearing in mind that as a forward, he wasn't a prolific point scorer. He was a prolific penalty minute gatherer. <laughs> and he certainly wasn't popular outside of Nottingham. So so why Barry and Icar? Well, a few things. I, I think ultimately the fact that this is my top line, not my my pick of the best players that have played for Panthers because he would be nowhere near that. But as I mentioned earlier on, my, my first game was that Panther Steelers game where he fought Scott Allison. Um, we lost the game 2-1 and Allison actually scored the winning goal, if I remember correctly. But I'd just gone into the rink as a 12-year-old boy and witnessed Barry Nykart absolutely annihilate Scott Allison. <laughs> There's a spell towards the end of that fight where he gets his right hand free and delivers two uppercuts and then an overhand right that, that I feel just watching. And ultimately, that was the reason I wanted to go again. And that's the reason why I, I, I went back every week was because I'd never seen anything like it. And for the first the first season, I, I got I got a, a Panther ship for Christmas and I went and got Nikar on my back. And then the year after when I got a shirt at the start of the season, I went and got Nikar on the back. And no hesitation at all. And ultimately, you know, as we mentioned, he's he was never going to make anyone's best Panthers team ever. But at the time, he was my first sort of hockey idol. He was what I enjoyed uh, and the reason why I kept going back for more. There was many a game where you'd see him dropping the gloves or throwing a hit or just generally being in someone's face, mouthing off. Uh, and it was exciting, as a, like I say, as a kid. It was great. I loved it. Can you see why he wasn't well-liked, especially uh, uh, amongst the fan bases of, of Sheffield? Latterly, in his Panthers career, wasn't very well-liked in Belfast, to say the least. Can you sort of understand why he built up that hatred almost? Oh, yeah. I mean, ultimately, he was he's always going to be... He's always going to be the type of pantomime villain against any team, regardless. But I think, obviously, what had happened in Chef in Nottingham with with Sheffield with the bench clearance and and things like that, uh, and then obviously the the brawl in Belfast, you know, completely it, it sort of it takes it that one maybe two steps beyond pantomime villain. You know, we we was used to have it with people like Andre Payet and things like that, where it was that sort of you know initially it started out that it was a bit of a nuisance and he'd, he'd scrap and you, and you sort of didn't like him because of it. But then as as things sort of progress and he, he starts doing more and more things, he, he completely understandable why other teams hated him. He knew what he was doing. He was he was from he was from that sort of old school era where hockey was completely different. And obviously, the amount of times that you you, you would see a fight or a brawl and before he's even got in, got involved he's already shirtless you know you just you don't see that anymore the amount of times you'd see a fight and Barry Nykar would have his pads his shirt would be off he'd just either have his that sort of singlet vest thing or uh, or just be completely shirtless so that people couldn't hold on to him and he'd just throw punches like I say as as a boy who'd never seen it before it just completely blew my mind 
it, it completely hooked me. It, it really did. It was it was that it was c- coming home from that game after after we 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 played Sheffield. I just remember going to school the next day and just telling my friends like I I went to the ice hockey over the weekend and just it was incredible. This guy just absolutely battered somebody. <laughs> And he just got he just got sent into a box for five minutes, and then he came back out. And the place was the place was loving it, and it was it was mental. And obviously, you know, you're sort of telling these stories to kids, and they're, and they're all like in awe because of you just you, you've not heard anything like it before, unless obviously you'd, you'd been to the hockey and seen it. Yeah, he was he was my first hockey my first hockey hero. I think that's a, a great place to to leave Barry Nykar there, and we'll move on to your favourite goal so Andy your favourite goal in all your time watching Panthers uh, I've gone for uh, Brian McGratton in the playoffs against Sheffield what a fabulous goal and I think most people will, will know about that so what is it particularly about that goal that makes it your favourite I think it's sort of uh, a bit like when I mentioned in, in the Cardiff game it's that roller coaster for emotions I think uh, in, in terms of a goal it literally has almost every aspect of hockey involved from start to finish. And it's, it's just the most surreal moment I think I've witnessed. We, you know, we've, we sign a guy who's played 300 NHL games and, and yes, he was an enforcer, but we kind of thought, Oh wow, we signed, you know, we signed a a proper NHL here. And and this Um, was a guy you could play. He, he he definitely could play, but he was, he was really slow to hit the ground I think and I, and I think there was a spell where a lot of people were sort of saying you know he's he's not good he's he's not yeah he's fighting a bit but we thought he'd be better at hockey and he really isn't and then he sort of he had a spell where he started scoring a lot and I think he, he went through that spell sort of around the second round of the Continental Cup and sort of brought that form back to the league and, and started picking up some goals and, and some assists and, that, and became quite a useful player but then that that goal against Sheffield is just absolutely mind blowing. So I, I think we score to go three 0 up, and then from from that face off, Fitzgerald offers him out, and he, he sort of turns it down, and and skates off. Sheffield end up with the, with the puck in our zone, and then McGrattan goes back to retrieve it, and Fitzgerald comes in to try and hit him, and then there's a scuffle along the boards. Fitzgerald's desperate to try and to get him to fight, and then there's that whole sort of pantomime scene of. McGrattan turning him around and sort of shooing him away with his hand, like really motioning, like, no, I'm not going to fight you. Go away, go away. And then we break down the other end and they're still sort of at neutral ice, jawing at each other. And then it's almost like he just notices, like, oh, there's a massive open space there. I'm just going to skate into it. And he gets the puck uh, in the slot. And rather than shooting, he just holds onto it and just skates towards the the right uh, face-off dot. And then... You know the netminder's on his back already at this point because he's he's anticipated the shot. There's a defenseman in the way, but he he just places it into the bottom bottom of that net, and it's just probably the wildest goal I think I've seen celebrated, other than like a you know a, a cup winning goal or, or the league winning goal, because it was just so absolutely crazy. We just witnessed a guy try and start a fight and get completely mugged off, and then. The bloke that he's tried to fight has just gone up the other end and scored, and then just sort of you can see the elation in his face and and, and just the, the sheer joy of the moment. And if 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 that was scripted in a film like Slapshot or Mighty Ducks or something, you sort of chuckle about how unrealistic it was. Uh, and the fact we saw it live in the flesh, it was just absolutely mind blowing. It's just a shame, obviously, that you know the next night we ended up crashing and burning. But at the time, going four nil up in a in a Cup quarter final first leg, uh, and, and witnessing a goal like that to put us four 0 up was just absolutely phenomenal. It really took the wind out of ourselves that night. Absolutely phenomenal goal. You second forward now, and who is choice number two of your forward lines? It's Bruce Richardson. Bruce Richardson, who of course played for Panthers 2008-9 and 2009-10 season, 126 games. 35 goals, 95 assists for 130 points, 275 penalty minutes and of course was part of the Challenge Cup winning side in 2010 before he left Panthers to become the first coach of a brand new club called Brayhead Clan. So, Andy, why Bruce? 
because uh, I loved him. Basically, he was he was fantastic to watch. He was entertainment personified. He wasn't as good a player as Ling by any stretch, but he was sort of in the same mold of that old school, small, ratty, in your face type of player. But he, you know, he still racked up points. But he just did rack up like a hundred points a, year, a season. I think he got. Did he get up to like seventy? Put seventy odd points in his in his first season. I think maybe. Yes, I think um, he, he was definitely uh, more than a point a game player. Yeah, you know, so he was he was a real top quality player. But he was also a, he was a proper rink rat. And again, I don't I don't think until he came that I'd seen a player quite like that. Now, I'd seen, obviously, you know, we talk about players like Nykar and, and stuff like that. We went through the whole sort of enforcers and, and things like that. But I, I can't remember a player that was sort of small, niggly, annoying, agitating, just a real wind-up merchant, just constant. But could back it up as well. Know, absolutely. But from opening face-off to, to, the, to the end of the game, it'd just be relentless. And I, and I just can't imagine that... You know, if you go into rinks and you're playing teams and, you know, they've got like six foot six tough guys or they've got, you know, real strong fighters and stuff like that. I imagine as much as you might not want to face playing them, I imagine it's players like Bruce Richardson that you hate the most because they're just always there yapping constantly and jabbing you and sticking you and and things like that. And it's, it's just it was just so relentless from every game. But he bought the passion and he bought the energy to to, to every game, and and like you say, he, he he backed it up. Off the top of my head, I can think of five fights he had that were, were, were absolutely fantastic and real sort of highlights. He had the, he had the three fight series with Finity, um, and that first fight he had uh, at the arena um, oh, was one of the best just, fights I think I've ever yeah, seen. Yeah, just pure slugfest. I remember someone asking him. I think I can't remember if it was in on the radio thing that they did, or if it was one of the ma- match interviews, or in a post. But someone that said about like, oh, you know, have you got history with Finity? And he said, I'd never heard of him before. He said, until I came here, I'd never heard of him. But I was told that he's their version of me. And I, I the first time that we played them, they they square off at centre ice for my first face off, and they do that. He's never even, you know, there's there's no he has no reason to do it. He has no idea. There's no history there whatsoever. That was the type of player he was. He knew what he had to do and he was willing to do it. And then they fought two more times that season as well and they were pretty good. He fought Danny Stewart at Christmas and TKO's him twice. So he sort of, he drops him with a punch and Danny Stewart gets back up again and I imagine he probably wishes he'd stayed down first time because he gets put down again. And I think that was the, the famous Team Hollywood game as well. And then obviously the Jason Hewitt fight. Let's Let's be honest... Hewitt's made some comments in the press, I believe, about Panthers. And I think off one of the opening face-offs, I think Bergen offers to fight him and he turns it down. And then um, for the rest of the game, Richardson's chirping at him, trying to get him to go. And then there's a spell where there's a whistle and Richardson's just sort of like following him around like a shadow, trying to get him to fight, trying to get him to fight, trying to get him to fight. Till eventually you can see the reluctance in Hewitt, just sort of like, oh, let's just get it out of the way. And let's be honest, the start of that fight, Hewitt wins. <laughs> And then Richardson goes down, I don't think through a punch, but sort of like loses an edge and, and sort of goes to the ice. And then Hewitt makes the mistake of, of rather than like either chucking one in or just sort of like falling on top of him, he lets he lets Richardson back up. And then we all know what happens left next. You know, my one of my favourite hockey photos ever is seeing James Cavan of the linesman skating off with an incredibly bloody Jason Hewitt um, <laughs> because he's just been absolutely cut open by by a punch from Bruce. One of the things I always remember that somebody put was, I think he fought Stuart Kerr in Nottingham when we played Hull in the whole Rick Kozak game. Yes. I think Kerr throws a hit on Clark. It's quite dirty. And obviously Stuart Kerr is a big boy. And Richardson just steams in and just fights him. No no second question. No, There was no sort of like coming over and having a chat or like pointing a finger at him and saying, you know, like, oh, you need to stop doing that. He just, he just, the gloves were off and he just jumped in. I will, one of my favorite images I, I will always have of Bruce was of him jawing and squaring up to Brad Voff. And there must have been a foot and a half difference between the two of them on the skates. And he's sort of like looking, his neck's craned, like trying to, trying to make eye contact with Brad Voff. 
but he didn't care. I, I have a, I have a memory of, of Richardson in Belfast when Sean McMorrow played for the Giants. An opening face-off, McMorrow generally took the opening face-off on the wing, and Bruce Richardson lines up next to him, and I'm like, please, Bruce, don't don't go with McMorrow. It, it will it will end very badly for you. And, th- and thankfully, nothing happened, but. Just the fact he had the brass balls to just stand there with yeah. Sean McMorrow and, and make you think that he would even think about going with him. Ab- absolutely, because ultimately, if that's if that's any other player on the team, you know, if that's like Johan Molin or something like that, you don't you don't bat an eyelid because you you know nothing's going to happen. But with it being Bruce, you can't help but think he's not, is he? Is he? Is he actually going to try and fight Sean McMorrow? What's he doing? Uh, because he just he just didn't care. You see these stories about players, you know, like, oh, they bleed black and gold or they, they bleed orange when they play at Sheffield and that sort of thing. It, he really was a heart and soul guy. You know, he would he would put his body on the line for the club. He was a fan's favourite. And I, I, I would always remember the first game that, that we played against Brayhead when he, when he was there as player coach. And where I used to sit, the fans absolutely loved Bruce Richardson. And there was at least four or five people around me that had Bruce Richardson on the back of their shirts from the season before. And they were really excited to see him again and see him play. And then within, a, I'm going to say, five minutes at best, they were outraged with him about how dirty he was, screaming at the referees to get him in the penalty box. <laughs> and I was like, this is no different to what he's done the previous two years. It's just that when it was in our colours, it was completely fine and we loved it. <laughs> But now we've realised, actually, he's a really horrible, horrible player. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let's go on to your final forward choice. So, Andy, who's forward number three? Uh, my, my third and final choice is Lee Jinman. So Lee Jinman, uh, two spells with the Panthers. First in the Ice Hockey Super League, 94 games, 28 goals and 78 assists. Then coming back for his second spell when Panthers were in their first season in the Elite Ice Hockey League after he was cut by Timra in the SHL. 36 games, 25 goals and 41 assists and of course a Challenge Cup in 2004. Andy, you would have seen Jimman both in the Super League and in the Elite League. So what was it about him that made you choose him as, as your final forward? absolute wizard just completely and insanely skillful and, and and a joy to watch the the thing that really stands out for me is if you look at his if you look at the, the year he came into the elite league and obviously i appreciate that the standard of the elite league wasn't well wasn't like it was in the in the super league but he, he came back into the elite league and played in in the league games alone i think it was 26 games in the league and he got 47 points which is 1.81 points per game now, Ling was 1.71 points per game. And I appreciate that, you know, there's, there's that you, you can't really compare eras or players from so long. But you can't help but look at that and think Ling was exceptional and is probably one of the greatest players we'll ever see. And this guy came back and, and got more points per game than, than, than Linger did in his, in his spell here uh, in, in, that, in that Grand Slam season. He just beat, seemed to beat people with ease. He'd, he'd glide past players. His stick work was phenomenal. I, lo- I used to sit behind the goal in, in the early days that I started going down. And he was the first player I ever saw use the back of the net to beat players. And he, he would just pass the puck off the back of the net back to himself. And, and defensemen would just be completely bamboozled by him. Just un- unreal talent. And, and, and at the time, obviously... He had that connection with Kadot that season uh, when he came back, and they were they were just unreal. They were they were almost unplayable at times, and and just a, a really really good player. We were actually we went on holiday to Austria. Uh, my dad, well, my dad was working, uh, and we went across to Austria, and we found out that Salzburg were playing VLAC, uh, which was the other side of Austria. But we we drove down to go and watch it because because that's where Jimman had gone after after he'd left us. And we we drove down and went down for a game, and it's the most surreal game I've ever seen because it was it's not the family sport that we have in in the UK. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so so after every goal that the away team scored, the fans would throw stuff onto the ice, and they'd be booing, they'd be swearing, they'd be trying to throw things at players. 
and the scoreline was 9-10 to Salzburg. So it happened 10 times. And Jimman got three goals and four assists that game. <laughs> he was just different class. He, he was he was so good. And he was the first sort of player, again, the first player I saw that I started coming down where I thought, wow, that guy is like, he, he's by far the best player on the team. I love watching him play. And I, and I figure as well, Jono, that, that you quite like him. I do like Lee Jimman. Uh, I did like him a lot. A very, very skillful player, like you say. And he he brought another dimension. And he was sort of stereotypical of the forwards you used to get in the Super League era where the quality was just outstanding. And he, he, he was just, like you say, a different class. And then when he came back when it was the Elite League and to think we had John Craighead in that team as well uh, and Mark Cadot it was just explosive firepower yeah that's it I mean it's it's one of the things I, I, I remember him being good in my first year but uh, as I sort of mentioned that that first year that I'm going I'm 12 years old I've never watched the, watched the sport before you can appreciate the players that are better than the others but you, you don't really you can't really understand it because you don't really know the game but by the time he came back after he'd had that spell away I understood the game a bit better I kind of knew what was happening a lot more and I say it was just the buzz when he signed I felt the buzz when he signed in terms of like obviously it's it's pre-Twitter and Facebook but you'd go onto the cage and people would be excited Mm. um, and be talking about things on, on, on threads and forums and stuff and then obviously that first game that he's back in the arena there's a real there's a real atmosphere about his return and then obviously he comes back and, and does what he did he's a real big linchpin as to the first piece of silverware that I ever saw us lift a really phenomenal exceptional talent so that concludes your team which is Rastislav Rovinianek in goal a defence of Mike Reese and Corey Nielsen and a forward line of Barry Nykar Bruce Richardson and Lee Jimman I think it's fair to say that is a lineup that no one would like to face. I think it's a lineup that no of none of your other guests are going to pick either. To be honest, <laughs> I think I think you're pretty safe. There's going to be no repetition on uh, on my part. <laughs> <laughs> but that that is that is a formidable team. A lot of penalty minutes. It could it certainly uh, get a lot of time on the power play. The opposition with with that. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Of course, we'd like you to let us know who almost made your team. So who were the other players that you considered? Oh, well, Kay Wall, obviously for Netminder, because yeah. um, he's probably the only other Netminder, I think, that, that potentially you can talk about. It, it's the sort of defensemen I had, Beckett and, and Jimmy Pack, they were pretty close. Again, Pack probably failed based on the fact that it was the first two seasons. Um, and although he's he was so good and so calm, and such a, a smooth skater that I could tell that he was very, very good. Um, I just figured that I was probably slightly too young to appreciate him. Uh, and then forward-wise, you know, someone like Clarkey, who's been around forever, Ling, Beauregard, uh, and a personal favourite of mine was always Dan Tessier. Um, yeah, Tessier. He, he, my, he, now, he was a quality player. Yeah, it just, you know, again, he was one of them players that you could chuck on in the last minute of a game if you got a, you know you got a face off in your own zone, you win him by a goal. You send on Dan Tessier because you knew he was going to win that face off, and and he also did one of the greatest things I've ever seen in a hockey game as well. Where it was the first year that they brought in the you can't change on an icing, and we iced the puck, and Dan Tessier was 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 not on the ice, uh, and we iced the puck, and he he moved uh, whoever the netmind was the backup netminder at the time it's probably Woolly I guess uh, Jeff Wallhouse uh, he moved him out of the way opened the door stepped onto the ice skated a, a yard turned around and then skated off the ice and the referee skated over and went no 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 back on you come saw you saw you skating off back on you come uh, and Tessier came on won the face off and then jumped back off the ice again and it's it's what it was one of the things that's I, I can't believe no one else has ever tried it. 
it seems like such a it seems like it, such an easy and obvious trick to try and con the refs. Probably easier to do with when it was three officials rather than the four that we've got. It, now. Yeah, absolutely. But I guess I guess ultimately, the linesman just you know the linesman or a ref just literally looks up and sees a player trying to leave the ice, and straight away they're like, no, back on, back on you go. He was brilliant. He, he really was great. And and obviously he, you know that first year that he came, he was head and shoulders the best player. Uh, and it's no surprising that he he uh, he was snapped up, and then obviously when he when he came back after being at Sheffield, I'm amazed that we didn't win anything that year mm. with the players and the quality that we had. I actually watched that Sam Webster documentary that that was made that year about two or three weeks ago. I think it was called Beyond the Tunnel or something. It's sort of like a bit of a documentary about the team that season, and just looking through the locker room and that, you sort of think, how did they not win anything? Mm. You know, players like Brandon Cook, Galbraith, Tessier, Nielsen, Clark, Richardson, Bergen. You sort of think, uh, how Ruben do you looking after them? And- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I don't think he'll probably get picked by many because I don't think he was here for, you know, he was here for like a year and a bit. And obviously, I think a few people were soured by his uh, first season and then subsequent signing for Sheffield. But he was he was different class. I liked him. If you had to pick one of those honourable mentions as as one who would have almost made your team, who who would it be? Uh, probably Ling, to be fair. As much as I've just raved about Tessier, Ling is exceptional. And ultimately, I don't think my words can do it justice. I think Paul summed it up perfectly in the first episode. He was guaranteed to get you points, and a ton of them, uh, both goals and assists. I mean, he played beyond the edge, let's be brutally honest. I'm sure whichever Glebe brother it was in Sh- in uh, Coventry still uh, has a bru has a bruise on the back of his kneecaps from that slash at the end of a game that we'd won like five by by like three four goals and there was like a, a ten seconds left in the game there was no need for it whatsoever but he did it and got away with it <laughs> but that's just the sort of player he was horrible he absolutely horrible but yeah he probably he probably would have been in there had it not been for you know a, a few sort of fonder memories from earlier on in my my childhood mm-hmm. okay uh, we're going to move on to the, to the final section of, of I suppose your your history of watching the Nottingham Panthers and, and we, we we'll fi- we always finish with your favourite moment so Andy your favourite moment in your whole of your Panthers sporting career it would be Coventry in 2010 I think it was December the 4th 2010 where we, uh, where I witnessed my first ever bench clearance. Of course, the famous Coventry Blaze Nottingham Panthers bench clearance game, where Brad Crookshank, being taken off the ice, breaks free of the officials and rugby tackles Craig Kowalski, and all hell breaks loose straight after. I was watching that on the webcast, so I obviously got the joy of Dave Sims' commentary, which was fantastic. It's very As, good, especially with the direction of the cameraman to tell him yeah, which he, fight to. Uh, <laughs> to film. He does. He does go from commentator to director in a, in an instant. It's like pan left, pan left. <laughs> but of course, you you was actually there at the Sky Dome that night. So, just what was it like being there for that? It was it was incredible. It was really good. Uh, you know, I I I wasn't there for the for the Sheffield game. It was before I started coming, and I'd never witnessed anything like it. And it was, I mean, if you speak to Lou, there's not many times she see me that excited. I was, I was like a child at Christmas. I was like, my face was a glow. I was jumping up and down, like, and this is like 20 minutes after it's finished. I'm still just completely buzzing by this, and it, it, it was, it was surreal. We, we went in with a game plan that was quite clearly to harass Brett Yeager. And, and, and I think <laughs> it was. I remember watching other webcasts. It I, was brutal treatment. I've, I've never. I mean, obviously, we, you know, we sort of we we didn't really touch on the fact that when I chose McGrattan's goal, we and I said obviously we we got knocked out of that that playoff quarter final by Sheffield, and it was sort of it left a sour taste because obviously Weakman got injured by by John Armstrong uh, hitting him, and then obviously they they won on the backup netminder. But our treatment of, of Brett Yeager that day was was insane. I think in the first sort of five minutes, I think Penner had ran him twice. Matt Myers ended up running him, and Penner ran him again. So at least four times he'd been he'd been hit by Panthers players, and three of them were by Penner. And let's be brutally honest, 
you know, if it happens once, you sort of you say, oh, you know, that's unlucky. If it happens twice, you think, well, it might be a coincidence. If it happens three times, you think, hang on, there's something fishy. And if it happens four times and three of them have been the same player, then come on, <laughs> it's 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 crazy. So I think in terms of actually starting the brawl, that is a hundred percent the reason why it happens. I think, but I think there's a few more deciding factors. I think, I think the fact that Darnell didn't call any of them as penalties. So I think obviously Panthers' game plan was to get under, get into Jaeger's face and get under his skin, and in some instances actually make contact with him. I don't think Darnell helped by not penalising any of it. So obviously that would have got under the skin of Coventry. I think if if one of the players that, that Coventry had that year, if if the rest weren't going to call a penalty, I think if if Jason Robinson or Crookshank, if they just drop the gloves with Penner, it probably settles down, and and that's fine. And then it just goes a little bit weird in 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 the sense of I think Crookshank trips up Mark Levers. Crookshank gets called for tripping. Mark Levers I think gets called for embellishment, and they both go to the penalty box. And then whilst in the penalty box, if I remember correctly, Brad Crookshank makes a, an obscene hand gesture towards Tom Darnell, and is chucked out for a, for an obscene gesture. And obviously, as he's skating off the ice he thinks no I'm going to go and have a chat with Kowalski makes a beeline for Kowalski who sort of submarines him a bit and then all hell breaks loose and you've got players jumping over the boards, you've got players jumping out of the penalty box obviously Levers was in the penalty box at the time and Penner was also in there uh, for something else and just all hell breaks loose you've got Penner teeing off on, on poor old Brian Lee, it's not very often that I feel sorry for Coventry players but the first fight you sort of think oh you know Fair enough, Penn has just probably given him a bit of a paste in. But then, it, obviously, it all sort of goes down the other end of the ice, and they're just sort of holding on to each other with nothing happening. And then, out of nowhere, Penn just decides to carry on and just tease off on him again. And, and Brian Lee just really doesn't want any of it. Um, and there's nothing he can do about it. You've got, I think, Steve Lee and Robert Farmer. Obviously, the main event sort of becomes Jason Robinson and Lapine, and that's right down the other end of the ice. Um, so you've got Lapine and, and Robinson go toe to toe in a decent scrap, and then Lapine and Robinson get put in the penalty box. Uh, and Brett Yeager then tries to fight Lapine in the penalty box. Danny Myers comes in and, and just jumps him. Oh, uh, Danny and, Myers, uh, you uh, yeah. beat him to hell for that! <laughs> uh, absolutely, and and it, it just it's one of those things where it sort of every time you thought it was going to die down. It, it something happened again, yeah. and it just sort of sparked it all I say while while all this is happening down that end of the ice away from the Panthers fans you've got Penner deciding to carry on with Brian Lee for no reason whatsoever by now obviously Penner's shirt's off it's 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 attached to his fight strap and it's dangling on the ice and, and there's that there's that hilarious bit where he's he's skating to get back involved Corey's trying to calm him down and he, he sort of stands on his own shirt and falls over. And and I sponsored Penner that year, and obviously he, he, he left. He left after Christmas and went back home. But there was no hesitation in my mind when I got the email from the club asking me which shirt I wanted that year as, as gold sponsor of Penner, that I was having that black shirt from that game. Uh, and it is absolutely annihilated. The amount of rips, tears, holes... Uh, it's got 20p in it as well, so if I'm if I'm ever short of any cash, I can always go into my penner shirt and break open the 20p that he used as a as a second tie down for the front of his shirt. It's again, other than other than my Dennis Maxwell shirt, which is is my my favourite because obviously it was so cheap. Uh, the the penner one is is by far my 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 second favourite because of the uh, the fact that it was part of this game uh, and the fact that it's got some serious damage to it. And there's not many events in my in my time watching hockey that has compelled me to write a, a nearly a two thousand word essay uh, and post on hockey fight on uh, dropygloves.com. <laughs> but I did for this game, <laughs> um, and it's it's fantastic. It, it's really good. I mean, it it kind of ruined our season because we were we were doing quite well that year, and then obviously K Wall was injured off the back of it, and we went a couple of games I think with with Dan Green, and then we brought in Kevin Sampierre. I think came back for for a few games. Yes, yes. Um, and although obviously that helps as opposed to having a Brit backup for those games, it sort of derailed our uh, season a little bit because we were we were going quite well, I think, up until then. Obviously, we hadn't hit the Christmas peak, the Christmas dip. So 
there was always that chance it was going to go south anyway. <laughs> but it, it sort of felt like it was a bit of a real sting of the fact that as great as it was, we ended up losing Kowalski for a, for a few games off the back of it because I think he did his groin. Yes, um, he did. Which probably would have been from the combination of flipping Brad Crookshank over his back and Danny Myers clattering into him trying to trying to stop it all. So. But yeah, just phenomenal experience. And I genuinely, honestly cannot say whether we won that game or not. I have no we, idea. We lost 2-1. There you go. I, um, I, I remember the third the third period was just seemed to go at a pedestrian pace. It it just sort of it just yeah. happened. You know, there was no <laughs> there was no controversy or anything like that. It I know. Just... Well, I know there was another. I know there was another fight. There was, there was another collision with a goalie, and and Greg Zanon fought someone. I can't remember who it was though. But I just remember. Him. I can't for some reason. I will always remember him. He got a, a ginger beard and wore number five for Coventry. Just odd how you remember these sort of things. Uh, was it? It might have been Brad Sanders as opposed to Greg. But he, yeah, there was another fight in the game. But ultimately, it was it was really quite vanilla for the rest of the match, <laughs> in comparison. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, of of all the things, you know, a game that we lost has has, has turned into my favourite moment. Well, that brings us to the end, Andy. It's been it's been a great chat. I, I love listening to your stories uh, so thanks very very much for, for taking part no worries thank you for inviting me it's and, been a pleasure and thank you to you for listening uh, we will be back soon with another edition of my top nine but from me for now thanks very much and goodbye